Welcome back to season three of my podcast. I am Amanda Blackwood, the survivor. As many of you know, I wrote my autobiography as a survivor of human trafficking called Custom Justice. For those of you who didn't know, now you do. Keeping in line with that, this entire season is going to be focused on interviewing other trauma survivors who did or plan to write about their own experiences as trauma survivors and how they overcame their past. Get ready to hear from some truly incredible people. Please hang on for a moment through this brief advertisement. This is what currently pays for the show. Of course, I will also take donations through PayPal to keep the show running, or you can show support by a simple book purchase. I have quite a few out there. Just look for books by Amanda Blackwood on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Your purchase does go to helping to support local organizations that help fight human trafficking also. Lori Peters is a licensed professional counselor in the state of Pennsylvania. She's a national certified counselor, a level two certified clinical trauma professional, and a certified grief professional. If anybody should be on this show, I'm really glad she's here today. Uh, Lori has also got a background in journalism. She was a reporter and editor for various media for several different years. Um, She received her Bachelor of Arts degree from Penn State University and her Master of Science degree from Shippensburg University of Pennsylvania. Um, she also said in her bio that when she's not writing, Lori is right, uh, runs a private therapy practice for grief and loss. Holy cow. There's a lot of people that would really benefit from that, especially people that are involved in this show. Um, so y'all pay attention. Um, Lori, welcome to the show. I am so excited to have you with us. Oh, thank you, Amanda. It's a pleasure to be here. So Lori, where did you grow up? What was your family life like when you were a kid? Uh, Well, I'm a native Pennsylvanian, um, born and raised in South Central area, and uh, my childhood was uh, an understatement, tumultuous. Um, I and my sister grew up in a house where domestic violence was pretty prevalent, and that informed pretty much everything related to me, um, even today. Um, yeah, so, um, my, my parents were, they never should have gotten married. Um, both were also children of trauma and bringing that into the relationship just did not make for a great marriage. And unfortunately, um, my sister and I bore the brunt of that. So yeah, that was my, my childhood, um, did have some moments of fun here and there, um, but mostly when I think of my childhood, I, I just have a strong sense of sadness um, for all the things that I didn't have and should have had as a child. I think a lot of people can relate to that. I mean, pretty much yeah. everybody that I've interviewed for this entire season so far, they can absolutely relate to that for most mm-hmm. of them. Mm-hmm. Um, so how bad was the trauma in your house? What, what's some of the, um, some of the most tumultuous moments that you are comfortable, comfortable talking about? Um, the moments I remember the most are just my dad's unexplained fits of rage. And, you know, we walked around eggshells, um, around him, uh, because you just never know what knew what was going to set him off. Um, they were quite, a few, um, now, (laughs) I don't know, I always have difficulty answering these type of questions because my memory has blocked a lot of this stuff out. Um, Trauma has a weird way with memory. So the, the, the incidents that I remember are just ones that for whatever reason, my brain has allowed me to remember. And um, just a lot of physical violence between my dad and my mother. Um, he was abusive, physically abusive toward my sister. And with me, he was physically and sexually abusive. And then you have, um, the, you know, incidents of emotional and verbal abuse. Um, was, he was not an affirming, loving parent in a way that a child should have had. And, um, yeah, so that's, that's the childhood that I grew up with. It's kind of standard from what I understand for people to have their uh, Swiss cheese memory uh, because of their traumas. Is that something that you come across in your field of work? 
Yes. Um, the way trauma um, impacts memory, we still don't know fully um, about that, but you know, it's, it's exactly it. The Swiss cheese memory. Um, you, know, you remember bits and pieces. Um, but the thing is though, your body remembers what happened. And I still have a lot of triggers where I don't have any you know, rational or logical explanation, but it's obviously linked to what I adored as a child. Um, if you're familiar with the, the book, The Body Keeps the Score by Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, he goes mm -hmm. into great length about what happens um, with trauma when you really can't remember it, but your body definitely remembers what had happened to you. I actually have that one sitting on my shelf right now. It was mm -hmm. uh, given to me by one of the people who um, is a case manager at one of the anti-trafficking organizations out here in Colorado. Yes. It was so helpful for me. So I've got all kinds of medical issues and stuff, and I was trying to figure out how to deal with it. Uh, one of them is Crohn's disease. And back in 2015, they made a correlation between Crohn's disease and uh, severe emotional abuse. Yes. Uh, and I thought that was absolutely fascinating. And this book helped to change a lot of things for me. I've gotten a much better control on a lot of my health because of it. So I'm glad mm -hmm. you mentioned that book. Mm -hmm. I think that thing is amazing. Yes, trauma has more of an impact than we realize. And because of that, we need to research it more and we need to get the word out, uh, spread awareness, because it really does impact all aspects of life. And, and there are long lasting effects. Yeah, absolutely. What helped you to move beyond your trauma? Hmm. How long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> as much time as you have. <laughs> well, um, when I was in it and going into young adulthood, not much. I've stuffed a lot of you know things down. I was in denial about the impact for a long time. And then when I became you know a wife and a mother, I felt I didn't have any time for myself to deal with this. It's like, you know, it's in the past. I have to focus on this now. I can't go down that road. So I really did not start my healing process until I was in my late 30s, early 40s. And what that involved was um, therapy, of course. I'm a big proponent of therapy, um, as well as uh, doing things with the body. So I try to um, do like meditation, I do some yoga, walking is really big for me. I need to be out in nature um, and really tapping into the things that give me joy, um, almost as if to make up for the, the lack of joy that I had as a child. So, you know, writing is a big part of my therapy. Um, you know, connecting with people I trust is another aspect as well as music. So those are just some of the things, um, you know, very briefly that, that helped me on my road. Wow. Do you still feel um, the impact of this trauma? Does it still rear its ugly head in your life? Uh, yes, I am triggered. Um, sometimes I don't understand what my trigger is. I really have to, to step back. That's one of the benefits of also being a therapist. You know what's happening, but in the moment, it's like you're, you're back in it. But at least I had the knowledge now and the awareness to figure out, okay, what just happened? And then the trauma itself kind of, um, kind of gave me a sense of purpose. I wanted to be the person that I didn't have in my life when I was a child. So that set me on a road to where I am now as a helper, a wounded healer. Um, That's so beautiful. Yeah. yeah. That is really cool. And I'm glad you said that about you understand that you're being triggered and you know to take a step back, but you don't understand it right away. I, I go through a lot of that too. I don't have any kind of training in therapy. I've never gone to school for it. But when I feel myself starting to get emotional and I don't understand why, I recognize that. And I do take a step back. And I always kind of wondered to myself if that was abnormal, if that was strange, if anybody mm -hmm. else ever went through that. And I felt so isolated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you said that. Yeah, it, it is an isolating feeling because, you know, there's a lot of stigma around this. Nobody wants to talk about it. Um, yeah. So when these things happen, you feel like you're the only person in the world that they're happening to. Yes. And yeah. So it, it's, it can be very isolating. Yeah, absolutely. When you were going through, you said that you started your recovery process in your 30s and 40s. This is kind of when I started mine, too, honestly. Did you, were you able to find services and resources and people to be able to help you to get through everything? 
uh, eventually um, for the, whoops, sorry, my, my phone. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. There. Forgot to turn it off. Um, at that time in my life, um, you know, there were resources available, but I just did not have the wherewithal. Um, you know, the time is also, it was also um, in short supply, as well as I knew the work it would take to get me to a better place. And I wasn't sure whether I wanted to expend that energy because energy um, was a finite um, product for me. Yeah. Um, so yeah. It's expensive too. Yes, very expensive. Um, so I tried to heal myself, so to speak. It wasn't until much later that I realized, okay, I, I actually need a professional who knows what they're doing <laughs> and has walked this path before with other people that can guide me on this. Yeah, I mirror you there. I finally got professional help uh, when I was 39 years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was when I finally started therapy. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Oh, flashbacks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So how do you celebrate your wins in life when you've accomplished something, when you've done something great and you're really proud of yourself? Uh, I'm a big uh, believer in words of affirmation. So I have them posted all over my office. I say them every day. I have them, I have lists of affirmations on my phone. Um, so I, I try to hype myself up as much as possible. Um, and that in and of itself is a trauma thing because I never had that growing up. Um, yeah. It, it was, my dad was not one to, and my mom to some extent too, they were not people who were cheerleaders. I mean, they, you only got noticed if you did something right, put it that way. And God help you if you did something wrong. So. <laughs> oh, amen. <laughs> yeah. 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 So what do you do now that it's, now that it's totally different, just the words of affirmation. Do you have any kind of like a ritual when you publish a new book? Do you brag about it on social media? Do you oh, celebrate yeah. <laughs> going to dinner with your husband? <laughs> yes, I do. I do celebrate. I've got a birthday coming up and I plan to spend some some long overdue me time. Um, so, yes, I do celebrate. I try to celebrate myself as much as I can without being overbearing. <laughs> people, <laughs> people who know me intimately understand why I do this. Um, my sister, especially. She and I are best friends. So Aww. she she knows my motivation behind some, some of the things I do. So she understands my level of crazy. So <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> And I understand you have six kids, including twins. Holy cow. Yes, yes, yes. What are, what are the <laughs> age ranges for these kids? Uh, my oldest is 24. I have 23-year-old twins, a 21-year-old, uh, another soon-to-be 21-year-old. His birthday is the day after mine. And my youngest wow. uh, will be turning, is 17. Um, she'll be turning 18 here in a few days. So August is a very, very busy month for birthdays. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And the one was born the day after your birthday. Was that like the best yes. birthday present ever or what? <laughs> <laughs> yes. He, he has a special story in and of itself. Um, he, we adopted him. Um, I've had, I've had him since he was three days old, was able to nurse him with my, um, my youngest daughter at the time. There's like five and a half months between them. Wow. So um, that's a special story. Um, so yeah, he, it, it's been, it's actually uh, the birth mom, her water broke on my birthday. So, <gasps> oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. So she started labor on my birthday and he was born the next morning. So yeah, that's very sweet. Very sweet. And now he's wow. almost 21 and living his best life out in the Midwest. Aww. So are all your kids familiar with your uh, own upbringing and your, your traumatic past? The older kids are, um, I have to be very careful because I don't want to overstep boundaries. Right. Um, you know, I, so I, I gauge, you know, okay, where are you maturity wise? Are you able to understand what I'm about to tell you? Um, and then, you know, checking in with myself, am I really ready to share the story with my child? It's right. one thing to share it with a therapist or with a close friend, but with your child, you know, it's a totally different ball game. You want to make sure that you don't traumatize them as well. Yeah, there's definitely so, a fine line I found. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so you know, the older kids know, know, you know 
a good bit of my story. The younger kids know that my childhood was not ideal, but I have not gone into specifics with them. And I'm not sure if I will. So, yeah. All depends on the individual. Yes. Yes. Who do you find to be really inspirational to you and what it is that you do now? (sighs) Let's see. Um, I would have to say my sister is one of my role models. Um, I found out a lot about what happened to her after I left. It was like five and a half years between us. I'm the oldest. And um, apparently a lot of crap went down after I left that she didn't tell me until we were much, much older. So, um, you know, as far as resilience is concerned, I I give her a lot of credit. She's made, um, she's made her life into something beautiful. So she's, When I think of resilience, I think of her. And then professionally, um, I don't think I have any professional role models. Maybe, well, just maybe some, a few celebrities like Oprah. I look up to her because of her story. Um, Dr. Maya Angelou, she's like one of my favorite people. Um, You know, her whole entire story. She was the one that made me want to be a writer. Oh, wow. Um, she's her story so inspirational and how she lived her life um you know the choices that she made and the choices that she could have made so you know i i look up to her and and then you know some of my colleagues i know who've been through a rough time um, i look up to them as well it's always to me so amazing to find people who have been so hurt on their own in the past and have overcome that in order to become these helpers and they want to do something to help change it for somebody else. And it's just, yes. it's amazing. You guys, I'm talking about therapists in general are some of the toughest, most amazing people on the planet. <laughs> mm. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I didn't trust therapists for a very long time. I had a really bad experience when I was a teenager, mm-hmm. um, but my therapist that I met uh, back in 2019, she was, she changed everything for me. I would not be married to my husband. I would not have written my book and I wouldn't be able to do this podcast now without her having existed wow. in my life. So. Wow. That's wonderful. That's really good yeah. to hear. Cause I do hear a lot of negative stories about therapists and, um, you know, so it's really good to hear that you had a positive experience with yours. Yeah. Well, and one of the things that stuck with me was somebody told me one day, if you don't like your therapist, find a new one. You Mm -hmm, have to find mm -hmm. somebody you you mesh with. And the therapist isn't going to take it personally if you say, hey, you know what? This isn't working out. Um, We're on different wavelengths. I'm going to go search elsewhere. Or do you have any recommendations? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think that's very, very important. Yeah. Um, Because you're you're sharing the deepest and most vulnerable parts of yourself. And if you can't connect with the person you're sharing that with, then you're not going to heal and make any sort of progress. So you're absolutely correct. You need to find the best fit for you when it comes to therapy. Yep. Absolutely. What's one thing that you wish you could tell someone who's going through what you went through when you were growing up? Um, hmm, that's a good question. Uh, probably you have a choice on how you want to live your life and that life does not have to be defined by trauma. Um, there are many, the way my sister and I were brought, we brought up, we, we could have had totally different lives. Um, you know, we, we grew up in a rough neighborhood and, and a lot of the kids there, either died in early death or wound up in prison. I mean, you know, that very easily could have happened to me and my sister. But we made different choices. We found people to mentor us. Um, We we hoped, I think that's the biggest thing. We had hope that life could get better and we could leave our circumstances and, and do something else. So I think that's probably the, the biggest message I have. You do have choices and the way you've been treated doesn't necessarily mean you have to continue treating yourself that way or to treat other people. Wow. You're just so insightful and I'm, I'm so glad I got a chance to get you on the show. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you. Thank you. That, that means a lot to me. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm really... I'm really blessed to have this platform um, to share and uh, 
to because my main my main goal is to just help others realize that they matter and they have a purpose here on this planet and and yeah that's that's my goal so Very thank cool. you for saying that of course i i hope we can encourage more people to seek out the help that they need knowing that people like you out there exist and that actually genuinely care about them and understand what they've been through i just think mm-hmm. that's amazing thank so, you so um <clears throat> I know you are right now working on your second nonfiction book that's focused on grief. Can you tell me a little bit about your books that, that relate to your experiences? Yes. Well, the first book um, is a meditation guide, uh, Be Still and Be Bold. Um, that I was inspired to do that based on my experience and the experiences of the trauma-focused clients I've had. Um, so, and And basically what that book covers is um, the thoughts, the experiences, the feelings that someone who is a trauma survivor may have had. Um, and what I do is you know, I focus on one particular aspect of that experience, and then I use thought-provoking questions and um, writing prompts <clears throat> to go deeper into the journey. The, for my grief book, I follow a similar format, but I expand more on the writing aspect of it. Um, I specifically ask the reader to dive deeper by writing about their situation. Um, I do that with questions and I also have writing prompts at the end of the book. So, um, yeah, it's a deeper dive into grief. And I have found personally that writing is a really cool and awesome and helpful tool to navigate grief and trauma. So... Yeah. That that was my thinking behind that book. That is beautiful. And that's exactly what got me through and got me to finally let go of a lot of it was just writing it down, getting it mm-hmm. out of my system. At mm-hmm. that point, I felt like I had something tangible and I could pick up this thing and set it aside. Cool. I could finally cool. move on past it. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Have you got a part of your book that you'd be willing to share with us? Uh, yes, I do. Hold on one second. Okay. Okay, this particular section is called presence. Do you want me to read the whole excerpt or just a part of it or? You can read the whole excerpt however much you're comfortable with sharing. Okay. This uh, this is from my Be Still and Be Bold book. Um, It's called Presence. Presence like mindfulness is touching base with all your senses in the current moment. You are experiencing and noticing everything in that moment without distraction. The focus is on the here and now. Paying attention to the present is a way to alleviate anxiety as well as give thanks for the blessings therein. In a world full of distractions, staying focused on whatever we're doing is a challenge but practicing presence will reap rewards like clarity, intentionality, and concentration. Presence also improves relationships because you stay focused on yourself and the other person as you interact. Without presence, creating connections is difficult, if not impossible. And then for the rest of this um, entry, I lead you through um, a breathing exercise to go to get you in a more present state of mind. Um, and then I end it by saying another way I find that helps, another way I find that helps me stay focused on whatever I'm doing is to take a deep breath and say a little mantra, I'm here, be all here. This comes in pretty handy when I'm seeing clients all day, many times in back to back sessions. It helps me prepare and bolster my attention so I can focus on whoever I'm helping. My clients deserve my attention and presence. And then at the end of each entry, um, I uh, have a section I call an invitation to act where I ask certain questions to help you probe deeper. So question number one says, how are you present in your life? What helps to maintain that presence? And then number two, for at least one time over the course of the day, 
practice any of the exercises I just mentioned or another that you found to be helpful. Okay. That's very that cool. Section. Yeah. And the reason why I put that in there is um, with trauma survivors, I don't know whether you found this to be true or not. It's very difficult to stay in the here and now. Um, you know, for, for a lot of reasons, for me, it's anxiety. My, my focus is always what's coming down the pike. How can I avoid whatever distress and distraction? And, um, you don't want to stay in the here and now too long because after a while, the bad memories start coming up. So, um, by practicing presence, I'm learning to self-regulate, to calm down and to focus on what's actually happening in front of me. And then once I address that, then I take the next moment and the next moment. So it, it, hel it helps to calm, calm me down. My husband and I actually, uh, this is so common with us, with me specifically, that we actually have a certain phrase that we use when I start finding myself drifting while he's talking to me or while we're trying to watch something and I've completely lost several minutes of it, I just turn to him and say, I was thinking other things. Mm -hmm. And it started out as an inside joke, but it works so well to be able to communicate with him. Hey, I just completely spaced out and I went somewhere that I didn't want to go in my mind. And let's rewind this about five minutes and mm -hmm. let's try this again. Uh, and it's, it stops arguments. It um, helps him to understand what my needs are. Just simple four words. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, oh, go ahead. <laughs> it, it's, it's just so nice to, to have that kind of um, affirmation that this is a normal thing. Mm -hmm. this, this is what happens to our brains. Trauma alters the way we live our lives, not just the yes. way we think. Yes. And, and the research bears that out. It, it physically does alter your brain. Um, there have been numerous studies on that. Uh, and because of that, it impacts how you are in the world and how you interact with other people. Um, every quirk, I call them quirks, every little thing about me, every quirk, I can pretty much trace back to trauma. Um, for me, I consider it um, childhood trauma or developmental trauma, which pretty much set my personality. Um, so I, I can pretty much attribute every unusual aspect of my personality, the way I am with others, the way I am with myself, to what I endured as a child. Yep. Uh, I have to second that exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Including my sense of humor as a deflection. Yes, it's a very good defense mechanism. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Sarcasm is. is another one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I'm really good at that one. <laughs> I was going to say, just ask my husband, but please don't. <laughs> <laughs> so if people are looking for your book, where should they go? Where should they find it? Uh, probably the easiest way is just to go to my um, author website. It's Lori A. Peters, writer, W-R-I-T-E-R dot -E com backslash books. Um, I have um, the links to where you can get the book on that page very cool yeah i've actually been to your website that's a nice website oh thank you i <laughs> actually do for an overhaul so i uh i need to update it and, and add what i'm working on currently so expect expect some updates very cool well i'm excited about that oh thank you so there's always one last question that i ask people before i let them go um and it's kind of about how you see yourself. And I have a feeling that you're going to, I already know what your answer is going to be, but what's one thing that you love about yourself that's not based on your physical appearance? Uh, my resilience. Yeah. I knew yeah. it. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that has been the running theme of my life, resilience. Um, and I don't know where I would be without it, quite honestly. There's so many trauma survivors that can absolutely identify with that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So many of us wouldn't have survived if we didn't know how to just keep on going. Yes. Yes. What, yeah. Whatever you had to do to get through is fine until you figure out that it doesn't work for you anymore. Then it's up to you to figure out how you want to be. Yep. Figure out your new life. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Well, Lori, you are absolutely amazing. And I, I feel like I'm almost silly for saying this, but I'm really proud of you. You're incredible. Oh, oh thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you for doing what you do. Um, I think uh, your platform will help people normalize their experience and understand that they are not crazy. They're not freaks and they're not alone. So thank you for, for having this. Of course. Thank you. I, you know, when I first started this out, I was thinking, I don't know if I'll be able to fill up an entire season of a podcast with interviewing people who've written about their own experiences, but Holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> see you, you throw it out there at the universe and the, and the universe always responds so oh so many people write from personal experience it's crazy yeah yeah well it's it's what we know you yeah. know they say write what you know well this is what i definitely know trauma <laughs> yep yeah absolutely <laughs> yours and theirs <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, Lori, thank you so much. This has been an absolute delight. I'm going to let you get back to your busy life, but uh, when you get your next book ready to come out, reach out to me and let me know. I'd love to have you back on the podcast again. So if we make me maybe plug it and get you a little bit more sales. Oh, awesome. I appreciate that. Thank you so much again. Of course. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. If you've enjoyed tonight's episode, make sure that you head on over and check out the episode description. You will find links on how you can both support this podcast and how you can actually follow this author on social media. Check out their website, find their books, find their blogs. Whatever it is that they provide me with is what I provide in the episode description. So check it out. Go support our people.